as I'm listening to your voice, it, you just nailed it. You know, you you hit the right notes for each character. And I was so surprised that, like, when we're dealing with an actual rendition of Maria Orsic, who was, <laughs> a, you know, uh, Ingo Swan, yeah. these people lived almost in another dimension. And when you were voicing the character, I thought, wow, he he's clicking very fast on the inside because it's not easy to pick up the thread and understand the magnitude of it. And it's like, whoa, the elevators, uh, the elevator cables were just snapped. And what the, you know, <laughs> and I'm not going down, I'm going up, what, you know? <laughs> the dog decided to abandon more subtle ideas to go for a full-fledged metaphor to describe their predicament in the never. Master, he said, yanking Lionel into the conversation with a sleeve tug. Why don't you use the rectangle to navigate? Rectangle? Your black square. iPhone. Yes, iPhone, Commander corrected himself. This allows you to speak to another person, but not in person. That much I do understand, he reassured the fluffy white menace. Master, you are in fact speaking to a copy of the voice of the human voice, are you not? Tesla brightened at how the canine mind worked with just a tiny push. How is it that this pet of yours is smarter than you are, Playfair, using your very same DNA? Lionel gripped the leather-trimmed steering wheel just a bit tighter. Why shouldn't he be proud of his dog? And why should this be an either-or? Either he was dumber, or the animal mind was smarter. Hi, I'm Graham Mack, and I want to introduce you to one of the authors I work with. Her name is Quendrith Johnson. She's a Hollywood screenwriter, and she also writes for the big award shows, so you've probably heard her words spoken by some very famous people. And I got to speak her words because I was chosen to narrate her latest book in the audiobook version. It's called The Lightbulb Gardener. The book is a culmination of three years of research from Quendrith. It's a follow-up to her first book, DFW's posthumous masterclass. Quendrith says that four words came to her first as the novel took shape, and those words are the mysterious Lionel Playfair. Not knowing who this character was or what story he'd tell, she let Lionel run amok in the new wonderland that she's created as a homage to so many wonderlands that have come from authors in history from Alice in the original Wonderland, to Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, and Milo in The Phantom Tollbooth by Norton Juster. This is my chat with Quendrith Johnson. Actually, what happened, the light bulb gardener started because <clears throat> my aunt was dying of cancer and we have the same birthday. And God love her, she said to me, uh, why can't I write like Tom Clancy? <laughs> really? Loves she loves Tom Clancy. And I myself am like, listen, The Hunter Red October as a movie, I could, you know, fine. But, and then she also gave me the best piece of advice that I've never used. She said, why don't you write something people want to read? <laughs> I was like, why would I do that? <laughs> but the light bulb gardener is immensely readable. What she talked? Did she get to see? Did she get? Was she still no. around to see the finished article? No, she died. So oh, okay. Uh, and the sad part was, um, it, I it was an homage to her. Yeah. And then she said, "Don't use my name." <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to be in the dedication. And then I proceeded to, like, um, uh, you know, 
go through so many carbohydrates. I was just eating my way through the grief while she was dying. Right. And she said to me uh, before she died um, that she that she just wanted me to kind of remember who you are. You know, just the, our family line is kind of long. And yet she loves Star Trek, the next generation. I don't know if you want to include this, but it was, and she said, she said her biggest worry was that I would have to go through the birthday in July at the end of this month by myself. And I thought, oh my God, she's thinking of that. She's dying. Wow. And the first, last year was the first anniversary and it was, she was absolutely right. It was, it, and this year will be bad too. But um, I'm hoping that the light bulb gardener will be um, as diverting for me. Uh, I mean, as diverting as it was for me, for other people, because the, the weight of the grief was just, you know, there was nothing you could do. She was done. And she kept it kind of to herself for a long time. And then, so it seemed like a sudden death. But meanwhile, before I knew she was sick, the lectures were like, you know, <laughs> like, oh, I'm so glad you have all this uh, advice on how I should write. And, but I think to her, it was also so out of left field. They're an old Virginia family that, you know, had a grand and had been there since the 1600s, you know, so what's what's wrong in the gene pool that we suddenly have a right? <laughs> like, there were no other writers in the family till you? Uh, no, but my mother's uh, side of the family is so colorful. It's like, oh my God, here are they are. <laughs> Here's the characters. <laughs> She was well. She was an actress, and my her mother was a director and a writer. So, so your I, your mother was an actress, a stage actress. Yes. So that's Helen Cooper Johnson. That's right. Helene. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, Helene. Okay, and that's who right. you, that's so who you dedicated the book to, to in the in the in the. Yeah, I dedicated it to her because um, the last book I should have dedicated to her but I, I was like no I'm gonna... <laughs> she really liked that one but I was like oh no I'm dedicating it to someone else and then since my aunt uh, refused to be included in a nice way I thought well she and my mother and I are, are involved in another side of family business so I'll just put my mother in there and she and they were sisters it was, so no, was this side? that was her sister-in-law a sister-in-law okay Right. right. And I'm not sure, you know, they were, they, my mother uh, had known her since she was a teenager. So my parents met in high school and divorced, you know, years later. But, <laughs> but the families, uh, uh, so my mother's act, and, and in other words, my mother was an actress. My father one time played for the Chicago Bears. It was like the football player and the actress. You know? <laughs> and by the way, if, you know, like most worried, like, oh my God, she would see me on camera and she'd go, oh my God, you're breaking the curve. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she'd probably just smother me with a pillow. Anyway, but the grief over my aunt was, oh uh, God, it, I, you know, my father said, and this was his younger sister, her last words, <laughs> <laughs> Almost funny. Um, how long will this take? How, how long, long will this long? take? Yeah. <laughs> that's so like that's would... like that's got to go on a headstone or something. That's that's one of those yeah. famous last quotes, isn't it? She was not patient, you know, when it came to business. <laughs> you know? And I only laugh about it because it's a couple years ago now, and I can live with it. But. You know, she was so practical. I mean, I don't even have any of those genes, you know. <laughs> Her practicality was shocking. 
you know, she planned her funeral down to a T. No one could go because of the pandemic. And oh, she, okay. hated, she hated going to events. So this was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm loud, but... And um, the character uh, came out of a discussion kind of... Um, it started with Tesla because the uh, the my day job as an award show writer, we had the Tesla Award, and I've been writing things about him for years. Nikola Tesla, and, yeah, yeah, and just that my boss is Serbian, and I knew all these people who were Serbian, and then suddenly, uh, I just had a moment where his letter, the way they signed. It was like, it kind of clicked. And I thought, oh my God, he had, he kind of had a sense of humor. He was sort of a, he wasn't just a strange man. He was um, kind of intellectually affable. <laughs> and um, let me preface all of this by the friend of mine just said this the other day. She goes, why do you always talk to dead people? <laughs> I was like, uh, there, I guess there's a lot of dead people in my work. And so, uh, I think it was a year and a half ago, she, she was, she's really into psychics. And recently I went to this psychic who said, oh, well, you're Claire, uh, Claire sentient. You can hear people thinking, I guess, whether they're alive or dead. Not you right now, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> but I thought, well, that's ludicrous, but it's a great uh, premise. Yes. So when I was, I didn't read until I was like 22, right? So the reason I didn't read when I was younger is I would look at the book and I would, I would hear kind of the off behind it. Like, so on many levels, it wasn't just the words of the story. I could hear kind of the creative voice. You say you, know? you say you didn't read till you're 22. You mean you didn't read novels till you're 22? I mean that I didn't truly understand. I, I didn't have a lot of comprehension. I was uh, more of a numbers person. I started out as a physicist. Yeah. So math, math and science made perfect sense. But yeah the just literature are you kidding me like <laughs> except for the phantom toll booth which was incredible and i think that informed my entire existence as a kid you yeah know, i read that when i was like 10 or 11 and it was life-changing do you know okay. the phantom toll booth no who's a by oh um gosh i want to say his name but i don't want to get it wrong it's about milo this uh, I think he's like a fourth grader, and he receives this phantom toll booth, and he goes into the land of rhyme and reason. He meets a dodecahedron. I think it's, I thought it was Jules Pfeiffer, but it's not. It's, um, oh God, I don't want to get that wrong. Should I look it up? It's, no, um, it starts with an N. But you'll have to, you'll have to, Jules Pfeiffer might have uh, illustrated it. Can you look it up? On yeah, I'm looking it up like, right now. So it's called, it's called The, the Phantom. Phantom Toll Booth. The Phantom yeah, Toll. Incredible. Toll. The Phantom Toll Booth. Uh-huh. And it's by, it's by Jules Pfeiffer. F it first published in 1961. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, sorry, no. Illustrations by Jules Pfeiffer. You were right. It's a oh. children's fantasy adventure written by Norton Juster. Yeah. With but, illustrations by Jules yeah. Pfeiffer. Yeah, Norton Juster. So that book changed everything because uh, it, it, it uh, included the world of math and science, which I love. <laughs> you were already there with the math and the science, right? Right. Right. My older son is an engineer uh, at um, one of the big four tech. He's a senior engineer in his 20s. And he had such a graph of coding. And that's how I felt about math and science. 
So you were totally it. left brain. Yeah. I, to use I the Star it. Trek analogy, you were Spock, not Kirk. <laughs> well, there's another weird component, which is um, it's kind of both. And it always, I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I started out left and went right or right and went left. <laughs> I don't know. But my um, my mother's mother was, a po uh, what did she call herself, a polymath? She was ambidextrous, and I am that way too. And she she just, she was a really brilliant woman. And it was much harder for her because she had to become an accountant, <laughs> you know? But then she was a director. Then she directed plays and wrote for a newspaper. You know, she she found a creative outlet, but she was both. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> wow. Wow. What the old joke is, I'd give my right arm to be ambidextrous, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so your name then, Quendrith, have I got the pronunciation correct? Uh-huh. It sounds like a Welsh name to me. Yes, you're absolutely right. So... Uh, my mother spent a lot of time in the rare book room at the Boston Public Library. Which is where you grew up, in Boston? Which is where she got the name. <laughs> oh, she well, she got it from a book? What, like an old Dylan Thomas or something? What was it? What, no, so what Welsh uh, author inspired her? Well, now there's like a show called Vikings, and there's yeah. Queen Quendrith. She was a Welsh queen. My mother anglicized it, but there was a time when I was getting texts or like, crossing lines with the the viking whatever series that was and it was like oh my god except they did it more in the welsh way where the uh the vowels were wise yeah but, yeah yeah so. yeah right. now that's all you need to know right <laughs> yeah that's what that yeah and <laughs> okay so last time we were in communication you were having an issue um because your laptop had got stolen in in Cannes, you were attending the Cannes Film Festival and something went horribly wrong. What's the latest? Are you back on track or are you still electronically uh, locked out of the world? I'm locked out still. Uh, for some reason, Gmail doesn't believe that Quendrith at Gmail is my email. Okay. You know. uh, right. But um, the, the accidental reset I think has been good, ultimately. I never would have changed my computer. I would have um, stayed with some of the older writers. And um, the, it, it, was, it was so harrowing, actually, that I ended up driving all the way to Switzerland before I got over it, right? <laughs> Oh, by the time I hit Lake Geneva, I was like, okay, it's gorgeous. Get over it. But all the, all, almost all the keys were worn off my keyboard. Like that. that so it's a proper writer's, a proper writer's laptop. Oh my God. You could, they were almost transparent. <laughs> right. And I love that. And I felt like, oh my God, you know, um, I think it was my older sister who described me like a baseball player, you know, like uh, th there's like certain things that have to line up. Like only that computer was like the, the computer I could write on. But then I realized there was too much journalism on it. So it's like, <laughs> I mean, none of, it's nonsensical. So. But did you lose any work that you would do in like big work, like novels and stuff that you're working uh, on? Yeah, I'm gonna try not to cry. I lost 25 years worth of stuff. I lost entire poetry collections, which it's embarrassing to say you wrote poetry. I I lost short stories from years, and some of them, some of them, or at least one. I, I'm waiting for them to be rejected, as usual. You know, sometimes that happens. One of them's still out at the New Yorker, which. <laughs> Hopefully they'll reject that. Maybe, you know, they'll send it back, but no, because it was electronic. But I won't even know because it's on my other email. Um, I lost an original manuscript. Now, we're not talking Hadley losing Hemingway's valise, trust me. But 
uh, that was part of uh, that was written from when I was an intern in Hollywood and I worked for uh, A. Kitman Ho's production company. That's uh, he's tied. He was tied to Oliver Stone at the time. And I kind of wrote a parody satire and it was actually, I had sold it before. And then that the publisher went under. So it was like, fine. I got the manuscript back, but why did I have the original with me? Like how stupid is that? There was no, elect, there no you know, it was hard pop. So yeah. there no, it's, it's, you know, fine. but then I thought, uh, my writing is better now, you know? I mean, when I say better, I mean, I'm used to long form in a way that I wasn't before. Yeah. So when I say long form, I'm talking um, over 200 pages because when, you, I don't know if you other writers work this way, but when I'm writing something over, uh, I mean, when I, over 200 pages, I'm actually carrying around like 600 pages in my head. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So all the backstory and all these other things. And the next book after the light bulb gardener was the Pegasus Carousel. All of that is gone. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's, not time to revisit those characters start something else except you know uh something else emerged that seemed okay but like i say i mean you can oops, sorry I'm shaking this thing is it better yeah it's okay uh but i think it i think the yeah you know, the light bulb gardener, one reviewer had really something interesting to say, which is it sparked their curiosity, despite uh, the introduction of characters in the second half. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some you, you get into some very deep, almost spiritual stuff in the second half of the book. Yeah. You know, it really does go. It, it really, just when you think you've worked out where it's going, it goes much, much deeper and becomes more of a, I don't know, just more of an adventure than it originally started. Although it is an adventure when it starts out, but at the very beginning, you're trying to work out Mr. Playfair, what's his deal? Because he's not necessarily on the up and up, but he's a likable rogue and a charmer. And so there's that. And you're trying to work out where he fits into this this isolated town and then and then once it really starts going you're like holy cow and then uncle nick you know and all, when it's revealed uh, what's really going on there and then relationship with the dog and then the dog i mean i don't want to give too much away tell me if i'm giving up to you no, too but much as as i'm uh as i'm listening to your voice it, you just nailed it you know you you hit the right notes for each character. And I was so surprised that, like, when we're dealing with an actual rendition of Maria Orsic, who is, <laughs> a, you know, uh, Ingo Swan, yeah. these people lived almost in another dimension. And when you were voicing the character, I thought, wow, he he's clicking very fast on the inside because it's not easy to pick up the threat and understand the magnitude of it. And it's like, whoa, the elevators, uh, the elevator cables were just snapped. And what the, you know, <laughs> and I'm not going down, I'm going up. What, you know, <laughs> and why a dog? Uh, a dog is the friendliest way to kind of, um, these concepts are difficult, right? 
<laughs> but not the way you write them, because I, I, I never at, at any stage thought, I'm not smart enough for this. It was just a lovely, lovely, the way you tell the story and the way you paint the picture of the characters and you put them in the scenes is just, you know, I always, when I'm, when I'm reading audiobooks, but particularly with this one, I could see what was going on. I could see, I had the pictures. Yeah, well, that was also, when I was talking about the dog, it's because you're, if the dog can do it, we can all do it. <laughs> yeah. And I think someone mentioned that, like, wow, I really, um, I really like the dog part. My dog is actually named Commander. It's it's a German Shepherd, but um, right. my, my mother my mother had always wanted a West Highland Terrier, so <laughs> Westie. So and did and what what's the lovely thing in the book is because you've got Master and Commander. Was that was that before yeah. um, the movie, which was like Gladiator no, on a ship? To, no, it was, after, it was supposed to be kind of an inside joke. Okay. Like, a lot of those. They're called Easter eggs. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I thought, I'll just put a few in there. Even with Ingo Swan, uh, the cult of Ingo Swan, the people that knew him, uh, they'll, they'll recognize like uh, the little little things inside the Ingo Swan character. You know, like he's he didn't suffer fool, and he, yeah. you know, he was a remote viewer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You can yeah. see the rings around there. There's actually a ring they discovered around Jupiter, an ice ring. And one of the researchers that said to him, oh, you must mean Saturn. And he goes, I've been in the universe long enough to know the difference. <laughs> 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 and so because the imagination is capable of all of these amazing things, right? But when you when you see how history intersects with the spiritual side and the math and the science, and we're living in this kind of the oddest fabric, you know, that we know so little about. And it's, it's and a tiny part of the spectrum as well. Cause we don't even know how big the spectrum is. Uh -huh. And so, um, the idea of the light bulb gardener, like at the end, that everyone can shine a light is sort of, and at, you know, that in the end, I knew it wouldn't stand up to ta Tom Clancy or <laughs> my aunt's Star Trek fetish, but it, it you know, uh, we didn't know what it would be like to have a hole in the ground and have a girl fall through it and eat a rabbit, right? Yeah. So, the Alice in Wonderland concept was not a concept until uh, more, you know, there were all these readers who agreed that, oh, this could happen or, you know, or, or we're in that we're in it. Yeah. So I think with the light bulb gardener, once you, once the elevator cables snap and you go upwards in your imagination, like you did, I think that's where the, the journey begins. And it begins in such a mundane way in a small town, nobody cares. And then suddenly, uh, I felt that way too. And I think that was the escape from grief. You know, it was like you do. You oh. think you took something small, and you just it just it it, it <laughs> you know bellowed out kind of thing. You think that was as a reaction to to what you were going through. I have to tell you that the book surprised me. You know, like. As a writer, you would think, or, or I don't know how it works for other people, but you get to the, sorry, it was heating up. You, you, you get to this part in a book where you have to let go and you have to wait to see what these characters are doing. Now, I think there's a lot of writers who don't do that, but the ones who do, once you let go, it's fascinating. <laughs> are, you, are you saying that the characters take the story you rather than you steering it? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that you kind of, you have somewhat of an outline, right? Right. Like the title is 
the payoff. Mm-hmm. Once you understand the the mag, or once you understand the weight of that of the title and how it ties in. But in the middle, you know that uh, Tesla has to find Maria Orsic in 1975, right? Mm. Now, what's he going to do to get there? And what are the obstacles going to be? Well, let's let him fumble around. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, it's funny because I think... Um, I know people that outline and they sit down and they write for like five hours. And I think for me, it's um, the story is an organic thing. And the actor, Ethan Hawke, I don't know if you know who he is. I I don't don't know him. I know him by reputation and I've seen his movies. Yeah. I've never interviewed him. I never really had any interest in kind of, I mean, he was just an actor and he's not really Hollywood. He's New York. And I heard him speak about storytelling. And of course I was sort of biased. Like he's not going to say anything relevant to me. Right. But the way he, his reverence for storytelling hit me. Like it is kind of a shamanic, magical, uh, stretch of the imagination that you're so privileged to be a part of. Like, wow, Maria Orsic is coming. She had two other psychics with her. So they were like, they were like a triad, right? A, not a tri- I don't want to use the word Trinity. But, okay. But when you go into story, you go, Trinity. That was the Manhattan Project. Three of them. Why are these numbers important? You know? And then you're so caught up in it. It's like, oh my God. I've just been, whatever it is, sitting here moving my finger, but in the zone for like quite a number of hours. (laughs) Like 30 pounds ago, I was like, I used to walk around. (laughs) And I mean, I think that's the match. I don't know what it's like when you talk to other authors, because I think I'm a bit of an anomaly coming from, like, really, really, you know, being a full-blown physicist in my yeah. studies. Yeah. And even getting into quantum mechanics. But then realizing uh, the turning point was when I had an internship at IBM, and I got to meet... Benoit Mandelbrot, who uh, discovered fractals. And suddenly I realized the story that he told about fractals, which were used to measure the coastline of Normandy, they're a repetitive, you would call it, uh, I'll just call it a shape, but they allowed much more accurate mapping because they could scale down, right? So you could follow a coastline okay anyway the story he told about fractals and the discovery not an invention but a discovery and how fascinated he was i think that was the turning point for me plus uh there was so much sexism in physics they're like we don't envision you in research and i was like oh really <laughs> so it's like okay well and then I took a year of playwriting, but, um, you know, the influence of my mother, my grandmother, even, uh, her younger brother was an actor. Uh, he was a singer. I think he went to school with Chris Sarandon, who, uh, Susan Sarandon's first husband. Right. So they were, they were like a, a musical story, you know, acting kind of family, you know? Well, you, men- you mentioned you grew up in Boston. How did you end up in California then? Uh, film school at UCLA. Right. Okay. <laughs> so that so you'd made up your mind that you were going to be a director or just in no. films? No. What What was the goal when you when you went to UCLA and you studied film? What did you, What was the goal? <laughs> okay, I'm way less. I, uh, okay, here's the the funny part 
is, uh, so I was winning all these awards for fiction and uh, for short, uh, for poetry. And, but I, the first award I ever won was when I was 15 and I won a playwriting award. And it was for Albuquerque, it was an honorary mention. And it was Albuquerque Little Theater. And I thought, oh, it's for kids before I entered it, like Little Theater. No, that was somebody's last name. <laughs> so Oh, Mr. Out, Little. <laughs> yeah. So when they found out I was 15, they were like, yeah, okay. I mean, it was interesting. But the, the point is, when I applied to UCLA Film School, my older sister told me, oh, you won't get in. You won't laugh. And then I got in. And I didn't realize I was in film school. She goes, oh, you're, now you're in film school. And I'm like, wait, I'm just, it's just a, a master's program in screenwriting. She's like, oh, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think being um, an idiot really helps, <laughs> you know, in the Dostoevsky sense. I don't know. I mean, just that when you don't know how difficult things are, uh, like I wouldn't have lasted in any in writing if i had known how difficult it is it'll take your life i mean just in terms of the hours you know the i uh during writing this i don't think i spoke a word for like i don't know a month and a half like i was so into the writing so the 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 way that you were communicating with the world was through the text of the light bulb gardener rather than interacting with other humans pretty much you were interacting with the characters in the book which were actually which had actually come out of you correct well yeah you know i think writers like me who are colorful let's say i think their connection to the work is tricky because I had heard a lecture by Ingo Swan, and then there was a natural outgrowth of that. Like, oh my God, he's hilarious. <laughs> he thinks he he thinks that most people are so much dumber than he is, and yet here he is. He's one of the greatest psychics, right? And is has he been reading people's minds and he's bored? You know, <laughs> so. I thought he existed and he was such a fascinating person that just like as I do in an award show, I write speeches for like celebrities or directors or writers. I know what their, or let's say in quotes, I know what their style is kind of. And you So you can write it in their voice. Correct, correct. So, and then if you just push that boundary a little farther, <laughs> suddenly you're like, oh, okay. You know, just let it kind of let it take on the dimensions of story because that's what we do all the time. We create these narratives kind of like, oh, you're remembering the conversation you had and there was a little, you know, you're creating or you in general are creating these little narratives every time you remember something. And of course, we all remember it incorrectly, right? So, <laughs> yes. so it's a time machine. It's yeah. in the past. Yeah. You can imagine conversations you're going to have, time machine future. I mean, we're doing all of these strange things, and yet we're kind of so comfortable with our perceptions. And Ingo Swan did not want to be called a remote viewer. He wanted to be called a perception researcher. And that's where it was like, oh my God, he's, he had so much more to say, you know? Yeah. And so if he had something to say, give him an assignment. Find Maria Orsic in 75 or find, <laughs> you know? <laughs> now, once again, you know, as the ringmaster of these characters, I'm also in character discussing how I write, right? Like, oh, just a bunch of dead people and having a conversation. <laughs> it's called Claire Cox, whatever it is, you know, from that psychic. And then I also feel like, oh, but 
this is how we just ward off boredom, right? Like this earth, we're stuck in gravity, we're stuck in the grind. Even my genius older son, who's a coder, he's like, mom, it's a grind. I'm like, good God, he's got, but then he realizes how privileged he is to work in, uh, in coding and uh, programming. Yeah, So at this time in the it. world's history. Yeah. 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 And he was saying to me, mom, this is my Hollywood. I was like, oh, he's right. You know, it's like his, it's, it's his wonderland. And I think <clears throat> whether it's Hollywood or in the book, it's kind of, what if, what if we had an, another wonderland? Right. And yeah. that's where all these people are, where they have these mundane, oh, they get stopped by a sheriff or or the immigration, right? Yeah. And then, but there, the spiritual aspect that you mentioned hit a chord with you. Yeah. I'll, I think I know why it hit a chord with you. Because somewhere in the background with you, there is a deeply spiritual, like, beacon that was hit. And it's been there. So I want to hear about that. Well, I don't know if I can tell you what what do you what do you think in what do you think it is? Um, it might be event based, like something, but I don't know what age you were. Uh, but I see it like this crystal, you know, like the, you kind of like your interior light, and it's kind of like um, uh, it's not for day wear. Right. It, you can't, you can't, it can't be like, hi, I have these, I have this extra dimension. Right. Because I, I, I felt that in the way you read the characters too, that, okay, well, hmm, interesting. Okay. So he's used to this realm. <laughs> but now I wouldn't say, oh, well, he went to, you know, another country or met a guru or something like that. I think it's inherent in it. I don't know if it's genetic, but I think there's a kind of understanding that it just doesn't exactly have words attached to it. And that's what's so tricky when you're writing about these things or when you're voicing them, because you're adding, as the, as the voice narrator, you're adding, like you knew where to pull to add the depth. You know what I mean? But how did you I think I do, but I think I, I I just got so into the story that I just it just kinda it just kinda came out that way. I wasn't going, mm, well, should I hit that word and should I no, emphasize no, no, yeah. this and go up Total at the end of the thing? I just it just seemed to because it's so well written. You know, it's all there in, in the in the manuscript. It's all there for me. <laughs> no it's just it's it, it is a great it's a great great book you know I, and i loved read love 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 reading it and i thought the characters were fascinating and i really enjoyed uh playing the characters and and inhabiting them so very briefly um and they were just lovely what's what's next then for quendrith johnson is there going to be a sequel oh, or was the crap. sequel on the bloody laptop is it still in can with some crim who's had your computer away <laughs> yeah um i it was um it was my fault i was with a friend who uh, he works on movies and instead of catching the shuttle, I was hanging out with him on the Metro and I left my backpack unattended. And then they were like, oh, you know, like, you fool. And I thought, yeah, you're right. There go my, uh, anyway, there go my high heel. No, I mean, so all my, a lot of my red carpet attire went with it, but I didn't care about that. It was the laptop. So what's next is to, um, it's another wonderland, I guess. Like, I don't know whether it's still the Pegasus Carousel, but it's it's this destination. And uh, a destination book like the Light Bulb Gardener. In other words, uh, kind of uh, hitting, 
hitting that note again where it's like a free fall upwards. And uh, it has to do with uh, Houdin, the great French magician who fooled a bunch of world. They were, uh, it, I believe it was in North Africa and it was the light and heavy chest. And they, he rigged up a trick whereby electromagnetism was holding these metal chests down. And so he asked their, uh, their whole magical person, can you lift it? And of course, no, because the current was on, right? Yeah. Then it's, it's, bring yeah. in a child. Then they bring in a child and the child can lift it. <laughs> and that's how France conquered North Africa. I mean, you know, like that's, so along that tangent, instead of the heavy duty math and science, this is into the world of illusions in, on an, on the applied. Does that make sense? Yeah, but is it is it about will it be like the illusions being used to literally trick people, but not for entertainment? Using using the forces of entertainment for the powers of evil and not for good? Maybe. Oh no. There, no. The good no, because uh, it's in the digital realm. So the good and evil are sort of last century in this book. Right. And there's the sense of kind of, uh, how, do, how do I put it? There's a sense of in the applied, what is like best outcomes. It's hard to explain. Because in Light Bulb Gardener, you didn't, you didn't shy away from evil. I mean, we, we went to Hitler. You know what I mean? No, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> that was a different book. But what right. I'm, where I'm going in this one is because we're in the social media world and we're really in a, and I just recently visited the metaverse, I realized we, we need this kind of strange upgrade in storytelling too. So one of the concepts in the book is that an AI bot becomes sentient and it, Okay, but it falls out of its purpose. Its purpose was to be, uh, a, to work within like a, a piece of uh, a biosphere or something, but it becomes sentient. And then it starts to um, become, it's, it, it goes back through human history through the internet. And so that's when the characters, it becomes involved in story. So I don't know if it takes a physical form, but like I said, the Pegasus carousel, I might just go back to that because that begins with a tiny tin carousel, a little horse carousel that then becomes another kind of strange time. Machine. So the horses actually fly into the future. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's better if you read it when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> What's the next book you're doing? Uh, well, I'm working on I'm working on quite a few at the moment. Um, I'm I, I tend to do I've had a bit of a run where I'm doing uh, true crime books where I'm actually telling the biography of quite famous British Northern criminals, and I'm, uh, there's there's one of those I'm working on. I'm also doing a, a there's a four part parody, a comedy parody of. It's, you know, these motivational books. One of them is uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And they're basically, the, the, the books, these parody books actually take, literally take How apart. They're a comic take on each yeah, one of these, <laughs> these different books. And they're a lot of fun. But I'm also on book five of a British murder mystery book which is fun because you really don't know who, you, you follow the police through the investigation, you really don't know who did it till the very end in all of the others and they're set up in Lincolnshire and they're fun, yeah. yeah. But nothing nothing at the moment like yours. I've done some, I think the closest I've done to yours are the ones I've done for Danielle Pai and the mm -hmm. ones I've done for Ishkia Page, which are mm -hmm. both, they're science fiction books, Strictly speaking, but they do talk about other dimensions and uh, and and a few things. But they don't go as far as the light bulb gardener goes. They they don't they don't really they don't really open your mind up like how I would imagine an acid trip, which I've never taken. But how I would imagine 
when people say that the sluice gates open and your mind goes to different places. Which, which is hilarious because I'm probably the only person in Hollywood without tattoos that doesn't take drugs that like, <laughs> right? You know, right. Well, I, 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 I could, I could see somebody who does take drugs. Having thinking that time. you've taken a lot of drugs before you wrote the light bulb gardener. <laughs> I could see them thinking that. Not that yeah. I'm a drug guy or anything. You, uh, know, yeah. you know what's, I think, uh, I can't remember who said this, but just that it was uh, such an unusual book that it'll take a while to get kind of the, how to, how to read it. And that, that's why I think the audio book is so good. Because you sort it out, you know, the voices allow the, the characters to be kind of sorted out in a very gentle way. Whereas when you're reading it on the page, it's like, wait, okay, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? So that's why it was so great to hear, uh, to hear you voice all those characters. I just, it was delightful. So. Well, it was fantastic to do. It's called The Light Bulb Gardener. It is it is a, a full-on book, and it's now an audio book. There are links in the description on how you can get hold of it. And uh, Quendrith Johnson, it's a pleasure to finally meet you uh, yeah. live from your car in California because we had some trouble getting the Wi-Fi signal, and you had to drive for 24 minutes down a hill to get a decent signal. So I appreciate you sticking with it because I think this was worth it. By the it. way, by the way, lovely. Graham, yes. I never i i can't i i'm very camera shy but i'm doing this because you did such a fantastic job that i'm willing to ugh, have myself on camera just for you <laughs> <laughs> i'll and take that as a, again, as a huge compliment <laughs> that'll be great quinda thank you very much you're welcome have a good day <laughs>